Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. We talk to meditation, movement, and yoga teachers from Australia and all around the world about what makes them tick and what makes them great teachers. If you heard last week's episode at the end, I might have mentioned that we had Jace Tepatu coming on the episode. And sadly, I read a post from him on Facebook just recently that a close family member of his had sadly passed away. And Joe and I just did not feel right about publishing his episode and posting about him on social media while he's going through the sad time. We'll be putting his episode out in two weeks from now. Look out for that one. It's a great episode. I really can't wait for you to hear it, but I feel that it's a lot more important that we give him this space this time. And from Joe and myself, and I'm sure many of you out there listening, we are sending a lot of love, a lot of aroha. So best of wishes, Jace. Just before we get on to this week's guest, I wanted to talk about our yoga studio, Garden of Yoga. We had our opening last week. We offered a week of free classes and it went really well. We got to meet a whole lot of new people, make a whole lot of new friends, and that was absolutely wonderful. And we'll probably talk about that a little bit more in another podcast episode. But I did want to tell you, we do have an intro offer. It's just $45 and you get 10 days of unlimited classes. So I think that's a really good deal. If you're in the Melbourne area, go to gardenofyoga.com.au and check it out. All right, enough of the plug. Let's get on to this week's episode. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart, and Robin Carnes. Robin Carnes is a yoga teacher and certified eye rest yoga nidra instructor who comes from the United States. She is very well recognized as a pioneer and innovator in the field of mind-body therapies for trauma and related conditions. Her work has been featured in media outlets such as the Washington Post, Women's Day Magazine and Yoga Journal, just to name a few. In her impressive career, she served as lead instructor of the first Defense Department funded feasibility study of yoga nidra meditation for PTSD symptoms and also went on to co-found Warriors at Ease, an organization which has trained over 700 certified yoga and meditation teachers to work safely and effectively in military communities affected by combat-related stress. We were very lucky to catch up with her while she was in Melbourne for the Meditation Australia Conference, and we got to ask her many deep questions on Yoga Nidra, how it works, and why it can help so many people who have PTSD. Anyway, that is enough of me. Let's get on with the episode. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, the southern part of the United States, and then my parents moved the family to the Washington, D.C. area, and that's really where I grew up, is around Washington, D.C., in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And how did you discover yoga? Was that in D.C.? It actually was. I was 18, and this was way before, so I'm 61 now. This was when yoga was not nearly as me. I mean, like, almost nobody knew anything about it other than we had a PBS uh, public broadcasting system TV show called Lilius. And what I remember about that is my mother doing it and getting stuck in Lotus <laughs> and almost having to call an ambulance <laughs> she couldn't get out of it. So that's, you know, people, no one knew anything about, about yoga. And, um, but I stumbled into it over, you know, um, a weekend and I noticed that I had had, it had a different impact on me. I couldn't describe it, but I noticed it felt, I felt different from it in a way that nothing else had made me feel that way. At that point in my life, but when I was 18 and and I came across yoga, I already had a dysregulated nervous system. I didn't know to call it that. I didn't know that I had had so-called trauma, but I had had it. And now I know that. And so that's been very integral. So it was affecting me. Yoga was affecting me in a way that yoga affects trauma. But I didn't know any about that. I just knew like, wow, that tastes really good to me, so to speak, and I need to have more of it. But then it wasn't very available. And I moved to New Hampshire 
and there was nothing there, kind of a more rural area. So for many years, I, I would go for yoga whenever I had the little chance to do it, but it was almost nothing until I moved back to DC after getting a divorce in my 30s. And then I got married to yoga again, essentially, you know, like we went from like occasionally dating to we were in a serious relationship from that point forward. Oh, so interesting because a lot of people who I've spoken to, their initial experiences of yoga have been very much the physical side of the practice. And it seems like yours is straight away into the subtler layers of the practice. Yeah, and I would effect. say it was. I mean, physically it felt good, but there was something way more than that that I had, I, you know, that again, I could not put words around, but now I could. <laughs> and so were there any key teachers along this journey? Yeah, well, I studied with many wonderful teachers. I would say one of them was Rod Stryker, who is a tantric teacher. And then he really was the teacher that introduced me to Yoga Nidra. And I remember having a similar type of experience when I had the first um, Yoga Nidra experience. I, I remember thinking, actually it was a friend who like put a recording on or something in a group of people. And I got up from that and was like, I don't know what the heck that was, but I need a lot more of it. And then I was also studying with Rod at that time. And he you know, was a very expert on Yoga Nidra. And so I realized I needed to start studying it and teaching it, so I did. And then from that work was how I got into teaching at the military base. And then the study that kind of the little tiny study that changed my life and really changed in many ways, opened the door for it because it was at a major military facility. Uh, it was the first meditation study the Defense Department had ever done. And it was the second study of any type of yoga and meditation. This was in 2005 they'd ever done. So that little study happened because of a series of totally unplanned events on my part, Grace. And that is how being involved in that study was how I got in touch with and met Richard Miller, who's really my primary teacher and the developer of IRS Yoga Nidra. Wonderful. So yeah. just in case any of our listeners have never done a Yoga Nidra session before, could you take us through what happens? There's lots of variation, but the kind of Yoga Nidra that I teach and practice is called Integrative Restoration yoga nidra or i rest yoga nidra and as i said it was developed by this clinical psychologist and yogic scholar and teacher named dr richard miller and that form is a derivation kind of a modern adaptation of an ancient practice uh, known as yoga nidra and so to describe what i rest is because there are some distinctions between traditional yeah, we'll yoga definitely get into and that as well so but to describe what i rest is it's a 10 stage process essentially where in most once you learn it you can guide yourself you can you know lead yourself in it but most people for long time for beginners as well as intermediate it's a guided practice and for trauma that's a very important thing that's a guided practice and we can speak about that more later so it's a guided practice and it takes you through these 10 st steps or stages each one of those stages could be its own little meditation but you put the whole thing together and it's really a comprehensive um, meditation practice that addresses the entire human being. I will say from the most physical gross, not like gross icky, but dense gross um, part of us, the physical human body that is separate from, you know, your body, the discrete and granule in, in a quantum, quantum physics, it would be the particle all the way through more and more and more and more and more subtle to the wave you know, to no distinction between you, me, the rock, the tree, the air. It's just the web, the total pure awareness. So it is an inquiry into that full spectrum of what it is to be a human being. That's the integrative rest, I rest approach. Mm -hmm. I've done more traditional, such an under style uh -huh. approaches that use a lot of like a body rotation to mm -hmm. start with, taking its way through. And I guess that's the most dense layer. Mm -hmm. And then moving into some visualizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that something that Iris does as well, the visualizations and the body scan, or is it a little bit different? Well, so, I mean, do you want me to go into the all 10 stages? That would be great, actually. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So it there's definitely a lot of commonality with traditional yoga nidra. 
Um, but the things that are different, that are important, are a couple of different things. One is that traditional yoga nidra is not trauma sensitive. I'll give you an example. If you followed, if um, you know, my first introduction to yoga nidra was more from the Bihar school. And if you're familiar with that, some of the images are like a dead body burning yes. over a fire, yes. right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, or an open down grave. Down or, or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's nothing wrong with those images. And there's a reason why they're there. But they're not for people who are not healthy, stable individuals or working directly one-on-one -on -one with a spiritual teacher. And there's not a trigger warning. They just come at you when you're in a deep stage. Bong, okay? And, and I understand uh, there's no criticism. Like, I get why they're there, but that is not trauma-sensitive work and could be very triggering, right? So that's just an example. And it, so that changes how imagery is used in IRES. Now, I do want to say that IRES is not just for people who have a sense of, like, I have trauma. IRES is for human beings. You know, I've never met a person. No, that's not true. I've had people do it and say, eh. But most people, <laughs> most people find like, wow, you know, more of a sense of like, I don't know what that was, but I like more of it, kind of like I did. So what, number one distinction is, is trauma sensitive. And there are several different ways that that is, uh, comes into play. Number two, it's secular languaging. So there there is nothing wrong with spiritual languaging, but some people are super turned off by it, whether they have their own religion and it feels uh, like, you know, you're kind of proselytizing for them or it contradicts their beliefs, or if they're just an atheist or they just don't want to have anything to do with any kind of religion. A lot of people have been traumatized by religion. I'm one of them, actually. <laughs> so I was brought up in a very fundamentalist church. So I don't want anybody telling me how I should feel or think or be about anything, really. And so that is what's, uh, that's another thing that's very important in IREST is its secular languaging. And the, again, it's, it's culturally sensitive languaging, right? So it allows barriers to come down because there's not this like, whoa, what's that about? Whoa, I don't know that word. Ugh, so there's no Sanskrit, nothing. Doesn't take any of the power out of it. I'll just tell you that people, I've seen service members and all kinds of people, but lots of vets and service members have very profound experiences, kind of like, I'll have what they're having, you know? <laughs> and they have no words to put around anything that they are having. You know, it's just sort of, they're surprised. And I may have a few words, but I don't put them on them. But in no way does it impact pe the power of the experience it just brings barriers down and open stores and it sounds like it takes out any potentially distracting or triggering or anything that might pull you out of that deep state and get you back into the churning whirling of the of mind your head yeah. exactly that's right so those are the two big categories that are different there's one other way that it's different from traditional yoga nidra which is yoga nidra all yoga nidra this, that i'm aware of is based on the kosha model so if you're a yoga teacher you know that that basically is a model of human beings that goes from the most dense layer of who we are to the most subtle and in i rest there is an additional layer kosha added as the experience of my mentor um, recognize that there was still yet a little bit of hanging on before one goes purely into non-separation or pure awareness to the sense of like, that's my bliss. That's my joy. I own that. The I thought is very persistent. And so the last layer is that, that very persistent I thought, which is similar to all the other koshas in the sense that it change it comes and it goes it's not our permanent true nature but it's a pretty uh, strong story and most of us stick to it most of the time you know <laughs> so anyway that's the three primary ways that it's distinct so if you wanted me to talk about the steps I will yeah that would be great okay. so the first step is sankalpa in traditional yoga nidra but sankalpa in I rest has been expanded to include three different things one is an intention for this practice that helps a person anchor their, like, why am I doing this? You know, am I just on automatic pilot? Am I, is it time to space out? You know, whatever. But what is, why am I taking the time to do this? Okay. It could be a different answer every day, but it connects us with purpose. Second one is purpose. 
you know, more of a, what is my heart's deepest longing question, you know, which is more traditional type of Sankalpa thing, right? And then third is called inner resource. And this has been brought in really from some of the more modern mind-body therapies where a person develops for themselves imagery and sensory details around a scene or a situation in which they feel connected, comfortable, and at ease. Most of the time, it's something that has happened to them in their life at some point. Could be for me, like for my example, is that I have a, a dog I adore and laying with him on the bed and having his head on my shoulder while I'm meditating is, is just a huge resource for me. I have a bunch of them, but people have a huge range and it's self-sourced. So I don't say it needs to be walking by the ocean or it needs to be blah, 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 because You know, ocean might be a trigger for somebody. Who knows? We always self-source imagery in iRest. People get to choose what works for them. And, you know, it's different for lots of people. So that is a self-sourced, not only visual image, but multi-sensory image that one can return to again and again to connect with basically the parasympathetic experience of there's nothing to prove, there's nothing to protect, There's nothing to pretend. I can just be in that experience. So people practice that in itself as a little meditation, and it's a part of the 10 steps. So those are the first three steps. And it's interesting because even though this is a guided practice, those three things were all self-determined. And That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's very self-determined. I like self-sourced in the sense because it's coming through as opposed to either the teacher telling you how you should feel, which is very much the traditional model, or you having really so much of a framework of how you should feel, which is also very typical of us humans, is that we we think we know, as opposed to like what's actually coming up for you. And so many times, just as an example in the inner resource, I'll explain what it is, and somebody will tell me later, like, Oh my gosh, I mean, just something came out of the blue. I hadn't thought of it for years. Well, if they had been thinking their way to it, that thing would not have had the opportunity to come forward. And it's like the perfect thing. So that's why self-sourced, I think determined sounds a little too... uh, Yeah, it sounds like too much effort. Too much effort, right? And this is like, how little effort can I put into this and allow it to happen? So those are the first three steps. Then is body scan body sensing so some practice will have you just visualize this is not a visual thing because visual kind of activates the mind this is a feel inside the body sensory thing that alone could be revolutionary for somebody like who checked out of their body a long time ago for various reasons including trauma then breath sensing so that's typical i mean that's the same as traditional yoga nidra then sensing sort of neutral or benign things like cold and hot and heavy and light it's also the same as traditional and then emotional and that's also the same as traditional yoga nidra thoughts and beliefs same as traditional yoga nidra although the way they're handled is a little different i'd say and then ananda maya or the joy kosha with trauma you need to be very careful about how you frame that for people because they may not have much access to joy like neutral could be a great day for them. <laughs> so you could just be like, can you find even, you know, can you find any place in you that's just okay? And I guess you don't want to set it up so people feel like they're failing. 100%, you've got it. I have learned so much about how to say things that allow people to have their experience and be okay with it as opposed to, well, I, I didn't do it right. And, you know, there's a million ways we do that to ourselves, right? And then that, can you step back behind your personality and inquire into what that's like? Feel that, feel the I thought, feel the, the way the I thought operates. What's the flavor of it? What's the, and we all need an ego. We need it to function. We're not trying to banish the ego. We're not trying to banish any of this. There's no negative or positive. There's just feelings. There's just thoughts. Just welcome it all. Welcome it all. Be aware of it. It all just wants to be loved and appreciated and feel like it's 
belonging and have it often has a message for us of some type. And so welcoming the personality, the ego, the I thought, and then into that feeling of pure awareness. Okay, they're all operating all the time anyway, but the sequentiality of it is there's something beautiful about the map that the koshas offer us in terms of like unfolding and folding and folding and folding and folding into our true nature. So those are the steps. So just deeper layers of being present and awareness. Exactly, exactly. And then I imagine there would also be a integrating coming back to the world phase exactly at the end at the end there's a integration and you know kind of putting your your layers back on and putting your clothes back on with still remember you know being in touch with the true nature that's at the core of all of that beautiful Mm -hmm. yeah so just interestingly because when I learned yoga nidra it was introduced to me as a relaxation practice and one of the first things I say to people is, if you know this already, you know, most veterans and service members have never had the experience, so I don't really have to need to dispel them, but they've done something that's like a relaxation exercise before, so they know they're supposed to try to relax. So my first, you know, one of my first things is like, don't try to relax. This is not a relaxation exercise. This is actually an experience, a practice that helps us learn to be with ourselves exactly as we are. Because when we try to relax or try to feel happy or try to feel normal or try to feel whatever it is, not this, there's a tension there. I guess as soon as you put try in front of it, it's already... It's already a fail, yeah. really. You know, essentially, it's, it's a splitting from what is. It's a rejection of what is. So I have to repeat it many, 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 many times because our, all of our conditioning in our lives is there is a right answer and this is what it is and you should find it, you know, and if you don't, you're a loser. So, or you don't get a good grade or whatever. And to bring in myself a presence that says, I can be with you any way that you are and I'm inviting you to be with you in any way that you are. It can be very revolutionary for people. It was revolutionary for me. And I remember the first time that I talked with Richard Miller on the phone and and asked him if he wanted to be the content expert on this because I'd only been teaching Yoga Nidra a couple of years on the study. I got off the phone and my mind was blown. Like I thought I knew what this sucker was and I was so wrong. It was so much more than a relaxation exercise. Not that there's anything wrong with relaxation and it often occurs. But it's such a different thing to... The translation of Yoga Nidra is often in common things that I've heard, like yogic sleep. But the translation, another translation that, I've heard, that I learned from Richard is that, you know, yoga means wholeness and Nidra means across all states. Oh, nice. So it's no matter what the hell's going on in your life, there is an access to that part of you that's whole and complete. And that's a very different thing than now I will relax myself. Mm. So would you like to tell us more about the study? It was a small study developed in 2005 and then um, offered in 2006. And basically it was just a pilot study to see would people, could we get active duty people on a base, a military base to sign up for the, an eight week study? Would they come back? Would they do it? Would they, how would they feel about it? And so the number of people in the study was too small to have scientifically conclusive results, interestingly, in this little study that changed the world in a certain way. But the anecdotal evidence was they came, only one dropped out, which was very unusual. And they did the practice and they liked it and they felt better. So since then, there's been an explosion of yoga meditation studies in the military and there's been explosion of yoga meditation studies generally but there's also been over 30 studies done just on eye rest so you know you can go to the irest.us website and look under research and you'll see ongoing research as well as lots of completed research there so it's an evidence-based practice Mm -hmm. which no other yoga nidra is and that is an extremely important thing when you're trying to go into any kind of funded institution like the military or health care system you know they're going to want to see evidence base and there's a good reason they should look for evidence base especially when you're pay- paying taxpayers money quite a few psychologists that I know, Mm -hmm. uh, IRS practitioners and teachers. Mm -hmm. Do you think another reason why they're 
tends to be more research and study on IRST is a lot of the people teaching have a background where they have those skills and are used to writing reports and compiling studies and are maybe a little bit more tuned into academia and funding than your stereotypical yogi who lives on a hilltop who just has no <laughs> need for those things. I think that probably is true. The ha- fact that the originator, the developer is, you know, a clinical psychologist with many years experience and can talk the talk because he knows it and it's practice, it has a practice of many years. And I also think um, that you can become a IRS teacher without being an Athena teacher is a big factor. And so people can use, therapists and healthcare providers can use this in their healthcare settings without having to do the physical part of yoga, which is good and nice, but lots of people can't do it or they wouldn't get approval for doing it in their setting, depending on what it is, or they don't have the space to do it, or they're not really interested in doing it. So it gives uh, access to people of this amazing tool that maybe for one reason or another don't want or need the phys- more, tr- you know, what most people think of as yoga. With all this research going on, is it very well understood from a more Western model how this all works? Well, I would say that it is becoming better understood every single day. Like it's phenomenal what the kind of measure technology is allowing us to do now with uh, looking at how brain changes and neuro pathways are changing and brain matter is changing as well and all of those you know biomarker type of things i can give you kind of a lay person's explanation that of the nice. underlying premise of what's going on in i rest mm-hmm and many other yoga practices as well and meditation practices. But I will say that, again, I think it's really important for people to know if you want to work with people with trauma or you are a person who has trauma, has experienced trauma, not all yoga meditation is trauma sensitive. You can get worse from it depending on what you're doing because each practice has a designed impact on your, each pose has a, particular and and pranayam has a purposeful impact on the nervous system and most yoga teacher trainings don't highlight that or you know they're all about making a shape a lot of the time you know or stretching your muscles which again there's nothing wrong with that but it can make you worse so it's very important if you want to work with trauma that you train as a trauma sensitive teacher so i would say in a simplified but not dummy dummy down um, or inaccurate form the kind of the first central active ingredient and it happens in i rest in those first couple of stages setting the the inner resources part of it the remembering what's most important to you part of it and then the uh, kind of your core values and then the body scan and breath okay so those are the part that that first several i think it's the first five stages That is impacting the the autonomic nervous system by activating the parasympathetic nervous system. And so what has happened with uh, people who have experienced trauma or just are living with a lot of stress uh, chronically is that their sympathetic fight-flight system is turned on and is having a hard time turning off. And they can't access adequately the part of their system that has to do with rest, digest, feed, and breed. So they're in a constant state of, you know, to some degree, survival mode and feeling threat, threat, perceived threat, even if it's not conscious. So those several stages help people get out of their mind and into their feeling sensing state, which that alone dials in the parasympathetic. And then being in your body, feeling your body, even if it's not pleasant experience. So it's not relax your arm, relax your leg. Relax. We, I never use the word relax ever in a practice. I don't want to underline that. It's notice what the sensation actually is. So you're bringing this underlying principle. I'll come back to this welcoming, which is a very important part of I rest. But you're bringing a curious and kind attitude as opposed to you will do this, okay? Which, you know, just hearing that makes the nervous system tense, right? So it's more like however you are, I really want to know. I want to know how you really are. 
and you don't have to be any other way is the attitude you're bringing right so as you when you approach yourself that way and your body that way and your breath that way it's loving and when we approach ourselves with love the parasympathetic is also you know like oh this is the opposite of threat okay so first mechanism parasympathetic activation and regulation then once people are able to regulate and and become you know able to be in their parasympathetic state which is a state where we're all able to learn and grow where we're not really able to learn and grow and fight flight because we're just going to survive we're always going to make the choice to survive only we're not going to see a lot of other options but in parasympathetic state we see a lot of options we feel flexible we feel confident we feel okay with ourselves so that at that point it offers the opportunity to engage with content is what we call it in IRS. So that means, is there an emotion that wants to be attended to? Is there a thought or a belief that wants your attention today or that's been causing you suffering? And let's actually bring it in and see what it feels like. So, you know, invite it in to your, your attention in the same way you would a sensation in your hand or your shoulder. It's likely not a pleasant one but what does it feel like to feel with feel it and be with it okay so that second and and sometimes we use opposites which is we can come back to that if you want to but they're all just ways of actually inquiring into and learning to be with the messengers that are there well that is enormous i mean people drink and eat and work and bury themselves and you know material objects and do all kinds of things because they were never taught how to be with their feelings or their beliefs as you know in a relationship but not identified with so that we either dissociate for them or we identify with them and whatever neither one of those is such a healthy choice but if we have that healthy choice of actually meeting them, greeting, greeting them, welcoming them in and allowing them to be there. Usually they'll do say what they have to say and dissolve. Maybe they come back again, but for the moment. So this offers us the opportunity, the more we have that capacity for, for one thing, it has a huge impact on like addictive processes, chronic pain, that kind of thing. It has enormous impact on relationships because guess what? I'm handling my stuff over here instead of pushing it on you and it's your fault. Well, that to change the world right there, right? Regulated people who can work through their own stuff. And then finally, the opportunity to touch into and experience our true nature, that pure awareness that's underlying all this that is coming and going, that which never changes. And to more and more and more come to realize, you know, this is the home I never left. And to more and more and more walk around in that, you know, wholeness across all states. Again, you know, just like transformational change at a planetary level, the more people that are realizing that because uh, so many of our activities have to do with not realizing that, right? So I would say those are the mechanism, the three kind of mechanisms that are most prominent, I mean, that are sort of underlying the power of this. And the science of the first two is more well documented. When we get into that third level, that's an area where there are people doing work on pure awareness and consciousness and all that. But I think we're all far, much farther away from ever really, you know, of Maybe we will document it some way, you know, but as Einstein said, everything that counts can't be counted. So we, you know, we may never understand that. Yeah, it's a mystery, like basically. basically. To That's a mystery. It. <laughs> <laughs> seems like if you're trying to quantify it or describe it, you're kind of missing the point. It's like you haven't quite got there yet. Right. I don't think that science is going to be able to make that all tidy for us. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious about the imagery and how that's selected. In more uh, traditional yoga nidra, why are those images present? Mm. Well, because one way of understanding uh, what the whole thing of yoga nidra or what yoga is really, is it's provocative by nature. It's, mm. you know, people think, oh, it's this panacea that makes, lets us escape reality. I'm like, no, 
yoga is provocative by its nature. It's going to bring to the surface what is unintegrated, Mm -hmm. uh, what is unhealed, and what is not helping you. (laughs) And it may do that in a way that feels really inconvenient and unpleasant and causes suffering if you're trying to run away from it, but it is going to keep coming up. It's basically purifying, essentially. Not that we are impure to have these feelings or emotions, but to recognize, you know, not to identify with them. Okay. So my sense of why that's there and the best I understand about this whole practice is, uh, and, and it's, ancient roots is that it kind of reminds me of like a metal detector or no not a metal detector but a um a really really powerful magnet and as you do the practice there's this kind of magnet kind of going up and down and scanning your body and your body mind and spirit and it's like these little filings <laughs> that are in there go wiggle 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 Wiggle, 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 oh, look over here. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. And, you know, then they you know, find they come more and more to the surface, and then they just sort of come out. Mm. So sometimes we're very conscious of when they're coming out, and we know what they're about. Oh, that was, you know, this thing that happened to me when I was seven or whatever. And sometimes we don't have any idea that it's happening. We just know we feel better, lighter, and less congested and compacted. So... I would say the reason the images are there, the more challenging images, is that whatever that dead body's burning over a fire elicits in somebody, wiggle, 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 you know, the filings are going to come up and whatever's residue that's sort of from past experiences or beliefs or whatever that are in there is going to make that wiggle and you're going to become more aware of your reactivity in that area and get to inquire into it. So there's a good reason it's there, Mm -hmm. but it's also, it was originally meant to be done in person with a teacher who was very experienced and with, you know, basically in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And this is not being done. I Mm -hmm. mean, yeah, I'm a teacher and I'm doing that with people, but you know, these are people that can't get through out of the day without panic attacks mm. in many cases. And when I'm working with trauma, and by the way, not everybody coming back from war has trauma. Most of them don't. But um, whether it's sexual assault or childhood trauma or whatever it is, just like walking outside or getting in an MRI machine or driving in a car if they had a car accident is hugely challenging. I don't think they really need dead bodies burning over a fire. That's why I think. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's my makes, opinion makes about sense. it. Yeah. I've wondered about that one as well, if maybe it's like referring to the glaciers, like that fear of death. Sure, and I bet it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's like the open grave one. and Yeah. Something else I've wondered, uh, I know normally in a trauma-informed yoga practice, you would never, well, I guess you would never give anyone a directive instruction. It would always be a choice. Mm-hmm. But eyes closed in particular can be a problem for mm-hmm. a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Do you give like a soft gaze option in eye rest? Always. Or, mm-hmm. Yeah. And in any trauma-sensitive clash, you're right, you would always say, you know, because it can be very, because if you're hypervigilant, you want to be keeping your eyes on the, on the room. And so do you notice in the sessions that you lead people gradually feel comfortable yes. to close their eyes over time? Almost always. Mm-hmm. Always. Over time. Just like give them the space to let that happen at yeah. its own pace. Yeah. You give them the space to let everything happen at its own pace. Every, there's no agenda. There's no timeline that it's supposed to happen at. They may have one for themselves, but as part of our job is to help them let themselves off the hook and we let ourselves off, let them off the hook. And if that, if I do find that I'm having an agenda for somebody, I need to be aware of that and do my own work about it. Well, what's up with that? Why do I think I know better for that person? And I guess with a lot of the programs and the studies, they have a set end point usually, and that's when all the data gets quantified. So it'll be quite a challenge to separate that, okay, there's eight weeks of this, and this is what I want to get to at the end of that from the internal process of, there is no timeline on this work and it's not going to stop at the end of the program. Well, interestingly, I actually think that uh, paradoxically, the more you give people space to be as they are, the more healing happens. So it's the pressure would impede the outcomes 
And that's not why we do it, but I believe that is what would happen. That that is what would happen. We don't do it that way, so I don't know. But yeah, it's just saying, saying up that I'm yeah. failing at this dichotomy again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you touched on it briefly, but do you, do you think you could go into a bit more depth on how you happen to start working with the Department of Defense? Yeah, it was just kind of a bit a blessing. I had a colleague who uh, was working on a cardiac health study at Walter Reed, which I lived two miles from. And she went away for a few weeks to India and she asked me to cover her classes. And I said, well, I can't do any asana because I have a hurt back, but I could, I, I could do yoga nidra. And she's like, what's that? And I said, well, it's kind of blah, 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 blah. And she's like, and this is when I still thought it was just a yoga and a relaxation exercise. And, um, and she's like, I would do that with them. They'll love it. Well, she got back. She said, so I went inside my first military base. And it was very interesting. And, and I liked it. And then um, when she got back, she was like, she called me. She said, what did you do with those people? <laughs> and I said, I did what I told you I was going to do. And she said, well, they just loved it. I mean, they just loved Tell me more about that she had never heard of it because it was very early most people had not heard of it so I told her more about it and what I understood about it at that point and she said well that would be really good for PTSD and it was early in the wars then and um I was like yeah it would be it would be phenomenal and um she said well, we should do a study I'm like in my inside voice I said to myself yeah, I should win the lottery, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to work on that. And three months later, this woman who had like a part-time job teaching yoga at a military base, no positional power, had pulled all the players together for a defense department's pilot study on this sucker. And she called me and said, do you want to be a part of it? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> of course. So that's how I got involved. So uh, my life was forever changed by Rachel Green. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything I know about the military is from books and movies, <laughs> so I have no personal experience, but it seems like it's very much a culture of rules and following orders and putting your emotions aside because that's how it functions. And this seems like the direct opposite it to is. that. It <laughs> is. And when we, I think we'll be getting, getting to it, but I co-founded this organization called Warriors at Ease because it was crazy to me that yoga meditation was not available in more places than just two or three at the very beginning. And it, I could just see like the amazing things that were happening in these groups of people. So we do an online training, uh, warriorsatease.org, and we've trained over 800 teachers of all different varieties. We always recommend people get eye rest meditation training, but lots of people don't, can't, or they're more interested in asana or whatever. So we just wanted to make you know the training available for so that more service people could get more quality, specialized, safe, effective yoga. Not you know well-meaning people that are going to hurt people, <laughs> or not even be able to get the door open because they're too woo-woo or they come across that way. So um, it's military culture informed, trauma sensitive, evidence based. And the, the beginning of that training, the very first session is about the alchemy of opposites and how the military culture is like this and the yogic approach is this and this is this and this is this. And you should know those opposites because it's the power of them coming together that makes this so effective. You know, it's in many ways, my experience is that people have had more radical, powerful healings in a military setting than I've seen working in yoga studios. And I think it is because the alchemy of opposites. It's a very masculine, feminine kind of <clears throat> that I never would have known would happen, but there it is. At any point, did you encounter any resistance from anyone on the military side? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and still, there's tons of resistance to it. But it's changed a lot in the 13 years that I've been working on this. I mean, radically, mm -hmm. the whole idea of what it is and that it's not just for girls and it won't make you gay and, you know, you don't have to wear spandex and, like, all the typical things, like you have to be vegetarian and 
very first thing I would do with every single group. I say yoga, you say whatever comes to your mind and they'd pop it out and I'd laugh and they'd laugh. And then I'd say, okay, well, so let's just go through and I'll just say, you know, my idea of what this is. And I'd kind of gently and kind of in a funny way dispel all these kind of myths about it. But I totally understand why they have all those myths. You go into most yoga studios, what are you going to see? White women, upper middle class, tight outfits that are super bendy and flexible. I mean, they often would think that I was going to hurt them. They literally would like wince when they heard, okay, and this is your clinical psychologist the first day. This is your clinical psychologist and this is your social worker and this is your physical therapist. And this is your physician, and this is your this, and this is your that, and this is your yoga teacher. And they'd be like moving, you know, moving back, like, don't hurt me. So, yes, the answer is a lot of resistance. (laughs) Must be quite interesting. And much less now. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, anybody that works in the military, that's a lot of what the training is about, is like, here's how to not reinforce stereotypes and how to be culturally sensitive I mean, you don't have to pretend you're in the military if you're not. Although now, at least half of the people enrolling in our trainings are in the military or are family members in the military. So that's a radical change. But regardless, be yourself. But, you know, don't wear ohm symbols on your jewelry. Don't, don't do the typical things they're going to... Don't use Sanskrit. These are things you can do to be more culturally... It's a public health intervention, you know? The first rule of public health interventions is be culturally sensitive. So there's a lot of resistance and still is. And, you know, there'll always be opposites. So it's not that we're, you know, it's very important for teachers not to go into a setting like that or any setting and be like, I know that my way is really the best and I'm here really kind of as a missionary to convert you. Mm-hmm. That's baloney. Mm, well, I, I'm going to fix you. <laughs> this one other way that I'm going to fix you. And people can feel it. And they do not like it, mm. and it's not respectful, and it's super arrogant. It sort of implies they're broken. Yeah, <laughs> it implies they're broken, and you're not, mm-hmm. or you know, and you're not, and they're not. But it implies you know what's better for them, and basically everything that they've built their life on is not as good as what you've built mm. your life on. Well, my experience of working in the military is that I have learned so much more than I have taught. <laughs> about my own preconceptions, about what's good and bad and better and my judgments and, you know, who those people are and all of that. You know, I was just wrong, 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 wrong. And, you know, that's how it's really taught me yoga is it's made me see the ways and hopefully let go more and more and more of my own preconceptions about that are, you know, subtle and not so subtle. And we all have them about who has it together and who doesn't. <laughs> Nobody does, and everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like the practice itself, it's such a microcosm for the teaching because the practice is noticing what's coming up for you, like how you describe those little wiggly iron filings mm-hmm. that that magnet is drawing up, and that's within yourself. And then also as you move through the world... You know, you see those things within you come right back at you. That's right. That's right. And you get better at seeing what's yours and what's actually happening over there. And that's not yours to handle. (laughs) Why do you think it is that Iris Yoga Nidra is so effective for people who suffer from PTSD? Well, I think we have, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of touched on it. It's the effect on the nervous system, Mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. It's the attitude of going into the practice rather than, this is how you should feel, which is creates tension and more self-rejection, which we all have plenty of, and certainly people who have trauma have plenty of. And this welcoming principle that says, I'm really interested in actually how you really are, and I'm willing to be with it, whatever it is. Basically, that's love. And you know, we know that the more we were brought up with that, the healthier we tend to be. The more we can bring ourselves up with that, the healthier we tend to be. So I would say the underlying principle of welcoming, the effect on the nervous system, and the tools 
to engage with what arises in us as human beings that we have given been given almost no tools to deal with. And you can look around and see the world as much as it is because of those no tools. <laughs> and then the landing again and again at this home that we never really left, but you know, we weren't taught to be oriented towards. And so this is detouring back, but I think will bring us to a similar place perhaps. Could you tell us about your book, Sacred Circles, and how that work came about? I mentioned that I was brought up in a, a fundamentalist Protestant religion, and that was very damaging to me. It was very derisive of women in general and um, bodies, especially women's bodies. And so I was a feminist by the time I was, you know, 12 years old. And that was not, I know my mother wasn't a feminist. That was just something that kind of came up in me because I saw how my own family operated. And I was like, heck, this doesn't really look too good. And I saw how the world was operating. I saw how the church was operating. I was like, you know, where is there a place for me really? I'm a strong-willed person. I have a lot to say. <laughs> and so I, you know, early on became a feminist. And then with this background in, in religion, I would say the gift of that is that it was never a side issue. Like, you know, many people are brought up, like they never even think about it. That can have its pluses. So you can figure it out for yourself. But for, I didn't have that opportunity. But what I did have was, you know, the idea that a relationship with something bigger than me was very central to one's life. Now it took me years to recover from the way that I was taught that was central, which was very damning. And you'll go to hell if you do this, you go to hell if you and kind of, you possibly can't possibly win. And so finding a spirituality that was affirming and loving and empowering and nourishing has been really a lifelong journey for me that this work is in itself part of because of my own trauma background. And then the fact that women, you know, a women's way of um, experiencing spirituality has some distinctions. And of course, this is all vast generalizations, but there are some different ways women experience their connection to, to, to spirituality. And uh, so I started a women's group in 1992 with a friend, and we still are together. <laughs> it's 26 years. And that book came out of our experience of documenting, because we had a lot of people coming up and saying, we would like to be in your group. Well, you know, we, there's a size of a group that's kind of unwieldy. Um, we're like, you can start your own. Well, how did you do it? So we just, my friend and I that I started the group with wrote the book and it got published in 1998 and it's still on the market. So if you're interested in having a women's spirituality group, but actually I've heard many people use the group as kind of a manual on how to have a self-led group that's self-sustaining and um, allows all the members kind of equal standing. So um, that's how it happened. So it's like a roadmap, no matter what kind of group you want to lead, just some helpful strategies. Yes. Tools and strategies and guidelines for, you know, how to stay out of the common quagmires. And so I guess that leads us to another question, because in a recent episode with Jace Tapato, he talked about a lot about his work with men's groups. Mm -hmm. And um, we've also spoken earlier on to Anu, who leads a queer and trans inclusive yoga class. And I definitely see the value in a group that encompasses all genders and there's aspects of shared experience that we all share. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's something about that unique experience of people who share mm -hmm. a gender mm -hmm. coming together. Would you like to speak a little bit about that? Because you've taught in really male mm -hmm. dominated environments. And really female. And, yeah, I mean, I run yeah, women's retreats as well. So I have kind of both experiences. Well, you know, I think that part of the, I'll start with the men thing. I think that part of the reason men love the military is that it is a way to bond with men. And there's not a lot of ways in our society uh, to have a true intimate brotherhood. So a shared mission, a shared purpose, and you know, my life depends on you is a very, very clear bond. 
that is kind of a side to the question, but interestingly, more and more of the evidence points to that it's not as much of the combat experiences that are causing PTSD as it is the loss of that shared bond and the connection, that, that, that deep and intense connection that people in the military feel with each other and the loss of that when they come back to what is a very atomized individualist society that they can't figure out how to hook into and they don't feel connected to that causes the PTSD. So that's a different subject, but it's very important that we start to recognize how important that bonding is. So yes, there's so, and it's also part of the reason I think that there's a lot of resistance to bringing women into the military and especially into combat situations. There's a lot of complex things around that, but I think one of them is where do men get to be men, you know? Okay, so legitimate question, and I don't think it's going to be in the military. <laughs> For most, I mean, I don't think that's going to be it'll always be male dominated. Anything, my guess, but I, it will it, it will never go back to what it has been. It just won't be. So, as far as women's or just any, I think it just applies to any non dominant group that has felt like their voice hasn't been heard, their their perspective hasn't been welcomed in society because they are non dominant and their value has been questioned or diminished. That getting that group of people together by themselves, it's just empowering. It helps people feel more safe to be able to say or do or be exactly as they are. They feel that, again, that incredible power that affects our nervous systems of connection and intimacy and likeness and shared experience. And it gives people like an incubator that they can go back out into the world and be more. They know they have this group that has their back. They know they're not alone in the way that they felt alone before. And they can be in the world in a different way and probably speak out in a different way than they would have if they didn't have that that incubator. Like that sense of shared experience, like you're not alone in this, like I understand... You're not alone. It's not weird. It's not, it's, you know, your experience is something that other people have had to. And uh, we, we, it's, we, it is absolutely the highest imperative that we humans have that because it's about connection. And we all, are, in fact, are really ultimately connected. But the more we feel isolated from one another, the more and more we suffer. So it's another way that, you know, like there's a certain type of isolation that is. I don't know if it's consciously done, but it certainly happens where any non, any dominant group can split the other non-dominant groups apart from one another. Then they can all fight among themselves. <laughs> <laughs> or if there's no groups, everybody can just feel alone and disempowered. Well, when groups start getting together like that, things start to change. And so how have you navigated facilitating a male military group where it is all about that shared experience when you're coming from a different background? Well, it's very, it's very interesting how it works. You know, it's going to be different for every person. I think that there's some, I, we really try to reach out to men teachers because, you know, there's going to be a different experience there if it's just all men. And sometimes there's women students in the, in the room too, women, you know, vets or active duty. But in general, most of the groups that I've worked with have been, all of them have been predominantly male and uh, most of them have been, a lot of them have been only men. And all I can say again is there's an alchemy of opposites that happens because I'm a quite feminine person in many ways, but I do have a strong masculine side. So I am able to have a sense of authority in the room and yet have a lot of this receptivity and Welcoming is an extremely feminine quality. It's also very strong. So the more I can be a welcoming presence, I'm not trying to get them to be feminine or whatever, but I'll tell you what, I noticed um, after working with many, many groups at Walter Reed, you know, over thousands of, of thousand people over the years, that the softer side of men comes forward, the tenderness comes forward, the vulnerability comes forward as these practices start to take effect. And it's not that they're any less masculine, but their hardness, their guardedness, their tightness starts to loosen and melt. And, you know, I've seen them be so tender with one another that it would just 
you know, made me cry. It was so beautiful to see when they felt like they weren't going to be teased, they weren't going to be hassled. Just, you know, that is who we are as human beings and that it allows, you know, our culture doesn't let that come out in men very much. So I don't know how come it works, but oh, but it does. And it's such, it's been such a gift to me. I feel like it's healed my relationship with men in a lot of ways. It would be this amazing insight into how something that's perceived as opposite, how their mind works, you know, in similar and different ways to your own. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very been very, very interesting to see how are, how men are when they're just being, you know, I can't see it like I'm not there, but I can see a lot more about how men are with each other. And, you know, I appreciate it much more than I did before. If there was one core thing out of all of your teachings, out of all your groups and everything you do that you'd like to share with the world to instill onto other people, what would that lesson be? Well, that's a really question. shallow question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that, one, that one is not hard for me to think about. And, and that is the, the principle of welcoming. That's revolutionized my life. And though, I mean, I, 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 not that I did it, you know, not like I've completed that one and checked that box, but I will be working on welcoming the rest of my life. And the more I do, the better my life becomes. And the more available I come, I come to other people in my personal relationships and my professional relationships. And it's a very radical idea. It sounds so simple and kind of quiet, and it is. Um, but it's, it's a radical departure from the way most of us were conditioned to approach ourselves and other people and life in itself. So welcoming. Oh, beautiful. beautiful yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, picks of the week. <laughs> yeah. I can start with my pick of the week. Okay, yeah, do it. I recently went to a vocal technique workshop that a gym that I teach at ran, so thanks Virgin Active. And my two takeaways from this workshop were firstly to continually have some water with you to sip as you're teaching Uh but also using water um this is a technique to relax your vocal cords if Uh they're feeling strained at the end of a long day two centimeters of water in a bottle and i was wondering why to use a bottle and i tried it in a glass and water went everywhere (laughs) so that's why you use a bottle and then like a large straw is good and you just blow into the straw into the water for like a long, slow, smooth breath. And you do five of those counting to five. And then it's like you're gently chanting scales as you blow your bubbles with your straw into your water. And I could feel the difference immediately. Like you really can feel that relaxation with your vocal cords at your throat. And it's like, say you did a really hard workout and then you didn't stretch and you went to bed and you'd wake up the next day and you'd feel really stiff and your muscles would learn that stiff position if you really work out your vocal cords and you don't give them any release at the end of the day or any warm-up in the morning it's like you're just thrashing them so if you use your voice professionally or you just want to take care of yourself I found this technique really helpful and I can also put the link to the organisation that came so that you can find out more information for people who want to take care of their vocal cords. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. I talk a lot for my work and also I'm a singer, so I'm going to use that. Oh, wow. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, but you, you feel the difference instantly. It was so productive. Oh, great. Do you sure. have one, Ron? I do. After that great tip, it sounds quite frivolous actually but (laughs) my pick of the week is a youtube channel called rachel and nick or nick and rachel sorry and they basically uh, do little videos of cool things you can do around melbourne so they do it by suburb i think and they've done some really cool ones about brunswick and victoria gardens in the uh, center of town so that's a really cool little youtube channel to check out so i'll put the link to that in the show notes as well Well, mine is kind of a different thing, but I do have one now. Something that is very, very interesting to me and feels very compelling to me right now is how can I make a difference in the world that is um, disturbing in many ways at this time? And I'm an American and sorry for that whole situation, (laughs) everybody. (laughs) But what I've been thinking about a lot is the subject of white privilege 
and I've done study, I've been studying it and I really want to invite people uh, who are white to look at their own, the, you know, like I've done a lot of noticing how other people are dominating in dominant positions over me in my, in my life for a variety of reasons. And that's been very important for me to do. And now it's very important for me to look at how my dominance affects other people and how I can be looking at that and letting go of the ways that my dominance is negatively affecting other people. And it's very uncomfortable. It makes me feel bad a lot of the time, but I feel like it's really my responsibility. And uh, so, I mean, I can send you guys some, you know, a link to, you know, if people want to learn more about to do it, the work to educate themselves more about what that whole thing is about and why it matters. And I think it matters a lot. One more way of bringing the disempowered parts of the human human species and, and all that we are into uh, connection and integration and respect and having more of a sense of shared experience. Yeah, Beautiful. we'll definitely include that link. Thank mm. you. Mm. Sure. Are there any other kind of links or resources that you'd like to tell people about? Sure. I, well, I would like to point people to irs.us and there is a page on Facebook for the Australasia <laughs> uh, teachers of the IRS Teachers Network. There are regular trainings here. Then um, I'd like you to direct your attention to Warriors at Ease. And if you are already a certified yoga teacher and you would like to work in military communities, either veterans or active duty or their families please take a look at our training which welcoming is the you know the the principles of i rest are underlying all that we do in in that work yeah that's it warriors at east.org and irs.us um do you have any resources for anyone who might be listening who feels like this could be helpful for them personally someone who's experienced trauma or someone who just would like to attend an IRS session not as a teacher but as a participant or any online resources that you know could be helpful so this is my colleague Fioko Toyota who lives in Gold Coast and she's the IRS director of Australia Asia yes, yes. and uh, I work with along with Lee Blaschke and we together developing uh, IRS awareness in Australia Asia so I work and uh, do um, with the IRA, IRA office IRS office and uh, um, so I am the uh, trainer of IRS uh, training here in Australia and we have a product called Immersion so it goes over the weekends so people can come and taste what the 10 steps like and how we you can we can use it. you don't have to to learn how to teach or anything it's just like you know i want to know more about it and just come and taste it and it's you a, mentioned there are a couple of free resources as well yes so people. free resources you can go to iris.us and you can find a 15 minutes practice by record you can download it um that's is uh, by Richard Miller and it comes from PTSD book it's really beautiful um, it's trauma sensitive practice so you can taste it first and mm -hmm. then you can oh okay want to know more then there's a 42 records uh, uh, by done by Richard mm -hmm. uh, out of PTSD book so you mm -hmm. can download that too and it's 42 practices you can do and that's very trauma sensitive and I have several practices if you go on iTunes yeah, or right. Amazon that are all trauma sensitive. Mm -hmm. So breath practices as well as um, I rest. I have a whole set of eight practices that are just I, I rest oriented that are for sleep. So, um, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. We'll definitely put those links in with yeah. our show notes. Okay, great. Yeah, Excellent. another one uh, probably is a good one is uh, the Andagos' uh, I, I rest daily. It's a web web kind of based learning tool that you can go and uh, it's Iris daily. So it's how you can do it daily. And so you can learn it, how to do it in daily. And then once you get it, you can do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking oh, the time. Thank you. Yeah, great to meet you Nice both. to meet you too. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Oh, Very good interviewers you. and oh, really thoughtful you. questions. That was our episode with Robin Carnes. I personally learned a lot about Yoga Nidra, about IRS. I had lots of questions 
especially about the imagery, you might have noticed I was curious about that and I thought that Robin's answer was particularly good. I thought she gave a good answer for that one. For our next episode, we're talking with Jace Departu. As promised last time, again, I just wanted to send Joe and my best wishes to Jace and we look forward to releasing his episode. If you'd like to reach out and have a conversation with us, you can find us on Facebook, the Flow Artist Podcast Community, or you can find our website at podcast.flowartist.com. If you like the theme song, it is Baby Robots by Go Soul, and you can buy his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. I'll see you again in two weeks. Aroha nui. Big, big love.